All right, so we've switched things up just a bit. Tremaine Emery will now close out the show, and he'll be in conversation with the divine Karen Harvey. But up next, this conversation is going to be killer as well. All of a sudden, an athlete's walk to and from the locker room has become one of fashion's hottest runways. But the interconnectedness of sport and fashion goes much deeper than that, influencing culture itself. Our next speakers fully embody this perfect pairing. BMX wizard Nigel Sylvester, the first writer to collaborate on a sneaker for the Air Jordan brand, and Jessica Lomax, the EVP Global Head of Design for Calvin Klein, who previously led design at Nike. And this conversation will be hosted by Randall Williams, staff writer at Boardroom TV. Welcome them all to the stage. I'm feeling pretty good. How you feeling? I'm doing all right. I'm Great. doing all Great. right. Love it's been it. a busy day. Busy uh -huh. day, but I'm happy to be here. Right. Nigel, you and I have known each other for about a year now. Yeah. But when I wrote my feature on you, I did enough research to know how many endorsement deals. And I don't <laughs> want to mess up in my first question. Right. So my first question to you is, can you list off all your endorsement deals right now? Damn, <laughs> off the back like that? Off just, the back. Man, um, I hope I don't miss anyone. Uh, hey, better uh, not. Jordan Brand, uh, Specialized Bikes, Montclair, Smart Water, Hyper Rice, Xset, uh, which is a gaming company. <laughs> um, who am I missing? Anybody, anybody in the BMX world? <laughs> I mean, Specialized Bikes, man. All it's right, one of the best right, bicycle right, companies right. in the world, you know? Um, but no, I have an incredible list of brand partners that help me facilitate a lot of my ideas and dreams, you know? So I want to start with you. In you saying that list, I've covered the NFL and the NBA and different leagues. You have more endorsement deals than some receivers, running backs, quarterbacks, point guards, shooting guards, small forwards. Right. What is your approach as you mm. navigate conversations with brands and partnerships and collaborations? Right. Um, for me, it starts off with said brand and how does it connect with my life? It's usually products that I use in my daily life regardless. You know, whether it's things I use on my bicycle, things I use off my bicycle. I want to make sure that partnership and that relationship is authentic. That's at the core of everything. And so for you, Jess, when you're creating different things, what is the intention behind working with athletes? Is it comfort? Is it I don't know what else it could be other than comfort because yeah. I'm not wearing anything that's not comfortable. <laughs> what is the intention behind creating things uh, with athletes? Well, I think, um, you know, I work in fashion design and fashion is about people. It's how we express ourselves. So whether designing for an athlete or anyone, it's about who they are, how they want to represent themselves. And I think um, how you can make them feel, I think is really like the inspiration behind like a lot of what I do. Um, and I think athletes especially, what I love is like they're pushing boundaries um, and like pushing like human potential. I know the first time I heard about you, Nigel, someone showed me a video of you and I think you were jumping out of a plane with your BMX, <laughs> <laughs> um, skydiving and then landing right. and riding off. And I was like, what? This is amazing. And like the whole cinematography, the experience, everything. Right. And I was like, wow, the fact that you're doing that is incredible. Um, and so I love to like, think about all different people who are pushing boundaries, whether it's with style, with their sport, with like, anything they're doing. And I think that's like, amazing to design for that. So I want to follow up on that. After comfort, there is, people do wear things for specific reasons. We see it in the NBA all the time where people are wearing things to send a message. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw it in 2020 with Russell Westbrook's brand, Honor the Gift. Uh, in a collaboration with the NBPA. Um, with that being said, when you think about, as, you, as you're designing things, do you think about when someone is going to wear things as you're creating them? Absolutely. Yeah, I think about um, where they're going to be wearing them and how they want to feel. Because I think design has the power to like amplify how you're feeling. So like, you're 
already feeling a certain way, you put like the jacket on, it makes you feel even more like strong or whatever you want to feel. But I think it can also transform you. So I think, you know, if you wake up in the morning, you're not feeling great, you put on a great outfit, it can help you get into a better headspace. So I always think about that, like, does this person want to look fast? Do they want to look strong? Do they want to look sensual? Like, what's going to help them be like the best version of themselves that day? Because I think, I really believe in this, like, if you look good, you feel good. If you feel good, you look good. Um, and the comfort. Dion mantra. Yes, exactly. I with that one. Exactly. Yeah. But I, uh, yeah, I think comfort is like a state of body, but it's also a state of mind. Um, and I think designing into both those things is super interesting because... Um, like sweats might be comfortable for one person, but maybe like a suit is more comfortable for someone else. Right. We're all examples of that. We're yes. dressed completely <laughs> yes, different. <exactly. laughs> Nigel, for you, uh, you, I mean, when I wore a bicycle, it was always shirts and t-shirts and things, right. or t-shirts and basketball shorts because that was the most comfy. I was never going to wear a bicycle wearing jeans. If you follow Nigel on Instagram, he will wear anything on a bicycle. Um, how do you think about that when you're wearing different things? Because you have worn a wide variety of looks in your professional sport. Yeah, and I agree with what Jessica said for sure. Um, that Dion quote is so good <laughs> and it's plastered on my mind somewhere. Um, I feel like what like what clothes and what style can do is like unlock or like activate, but yet your superpower. Mm. You know, like you put on an outfit and that outfit is representing how you feel that day. And for me, like, it's usually a pair of Jordan 1s, good wax denim, good tee, baseball cap. And when I put that on and I grab my bicycle and I squeeze my handlebars and my feet's planted on my pedals, I feel like I can do anything. You know, and like, that feeling's incredible. And I'm sure it's for the same way for other athletes and people around the world. Like, when LeBron puts his jersey on or when Jalen Ramsey's put the shoulder pads on in that jersey, like, right. I feel like you can go do anything. Um, and it's so much power in that, right? And like how how we decide what we wear, man. It's 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 something that I feel we all can relate to in our own separate way. You know, I was even thinking about this album way over here. I was like, man, like even Clark Kent, right? Like he has his powers, <laughs> <Boof>. <laughs> right? But when he puts on that suit and turns into Superman, he can do anything. You know, <laughs> like and that's important. <laughs> Yeah, Superman doesn't save the city in his suit. Um, <laughs> Saves the world. <laughs> so now I'll ask a fun one. What is each of your items that makes you feel like you are your Superman or Superwoman? Does she go first? I'll go first. Um, you know what? I don't think it's one item because I think I change like so much depending on like what the environment is, what my mood is. Like It could be different like every day of the week. Um, but there's like certain things that I feel like... Um, Actually, I box, so I love like when I get to the gym in the morning and I put my wraps on, because mm. a lot of it I think is like the rituals of dressing too. Right. But yeah, I feel like when I've got my wraps on, I'm like ready to go. It doesn't matter what's happened in the morning before then, I'm like ready. Ready to hit something. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not the feeling, it's not the glove, it's you're ready to hit something. Right. Um, it's the Air Jordan 1s. Yeah, it's oh, definitely man. a pair of Air Jordan 1s. Spoiler man. alert. It's just a good, a good shoe, good like denim. And a good tea, like when I'm riding, I want to feel free. You know, I want, to, I want it to be fluid. So I don't like to have too much restriction. Jess, in your first question, you mentioned boundaries, expanding boundaries. And Nigel, mm -hmm. the Air Jordan 1 is a basketball show. I mean, right. kids wore it, still wear it, for a wide variety that we've been able to see grow over the years. And with you being the first BMX athlete to partner with Jordan Brand, mm -hmm. what was your mindset in approaching that partnership in uncharted territory? Um, I was curious and I was excited. You know, um, you've mentioned like being the first BMX athlete to sign to Jordan Brand, the first BMX athlete to design a Jordan 1, you know, and tell a very, um, again, like authentic story, right? So for those who don't know, like I teamed up with Jordan Brand and we created the first distressed Jordan 1 that sold um, pu like publicly, you know, and that set a tone I feel within like the just like footwear world, Definitely. where like after that moment you've seen so many shoes, like so many sneakers being like coming distressed, like yes. they came beat up, right? And the reason why we did my Jordan One distressed is because when I ride my bicycle, I don't have any brakes on, on my bike, so when I stop, I could be going super fast. When I stop, my foot's going on the ground and I'm ripping that shoe up, or I'm shoving it in between my frame and my bicycle wheel. 
So in a matter of days, like my shoes get beat up very quickly. So we decided to tell that story of how my shoes distress while I'm riding. And people gravitated towards it because it was a real story. People watched me kill and beat up shoes for years prior. All right. And um, it was like that. It was because the story was so real, um, it resonated. You know, and now that shoe's reselling for hundreds and hundreds of dollars on the market. Yeah, no, I can't market. get them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting to hear Nigel speak about that because I've skate, skated and longboarded and ridden skateboards before. And specifically, I only wear shoes that I'm willing to get dirty. I would never, ever, ever wear the shoes that I'm wearing today <laughs> on a skateboard. I just wouldn't. Um, right. Anyways, enough about me. Jess... Nigel mentioned storytelling. I see more brands focused in storytelling around product releases, whether it be shoes, a specific item, even if it's something within athleisure, oh, whether the photo shoot is taken at a specific place. There's more intention behind it now than I've seen in recent years. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, back to what I was saying about fashion is about people and people tell stories and love storytelling. I think it's like such a human form of communication. So um, I think it's more about like, it's not selling the what, it's selling the why, right? Mm. And I think having more purpose behind what we're designing, um, more intention, more of a like emotional connection with our customer, um, I think that's really what can resonate and cut through. Um, and yeah, I think for me, at the end of the day, I want to be able to make someone feel good and I want to be able to tell that story to them and explain like the thought process of designing into this emotion. Um, so I think the storytelling is really like more about the purpose. So you mentioned the why there. Now I want to talk about the how. When you, do, when you know you have a great story, sometimes it isn't a why, it's how do I get people to see it? Mm. How do you do that? Because I don't know how. I think... Um, you know, just thinking about this, um, it's really important to have a very strong intention and strong story from the beginning. Mm. Because, you know, um, there's someone I work with who always says, many filters make weak coffee. Mm. I think you want to make sure that, like, if you have a strong message or a strong story, that you're able to really, like, get it all the way through. And the easiest way to do that is for it to be really clear and impactful and meaningful to people. And then I think it can really last. And I think... At the same time, there is also diversity and inclusion. When you're targeting a specific audience, it's difficult to do that when you're outside of the people from the, you're trying to reach. Nigel, with you being, going back to Jordan brand, of course, and some of your other deals as well, whether it be the only BMXer, mm -hmm. the first black BMXer, or both, right. speak to me a little bit about what it's like being the only person that looks like you entering a room that no one has ever entered. Um. I feel I have responsibility for myself, for my community, for the next kid up. You know, like there's so many athletes before me that broke down barriers, right? Um, broke down walls and, and things of that nature. And for me, I was like, okay, well, how can I leave my stamp on that, you know? And just for you, <clears throat> what's that like? You know, I design for like a lot of different people because I'm working for like a global brand. So you're designing for a lot of different people, different cultures. Um, so I think it's about making sure to understand, travel, experience, talk to people, make sure there's a lot of people around the table. Um, actually in my office, I have a desk that I've never really sat at, but I have a big like <laughs> collaboration table. And that's pretty much like where I sit all the time. And it's about bringing in a lot of different people, having conversations, learning from each other. Um, and actually I have designed for a lot of athletes and that's really interesting because especially doing like the Olympics or Paralympics, um, a shot putter to a gymnast to a basketball player are like very different types of people. Um, and then often through the Olympics you would design one outfit. So how do you like create this sense of like unity and like community amongst a group of people but also celebrate individuality? I think is really the challenge for a designer. Interesting, uh, you mentioned trends then one of the biggest trends over the last two to three years has been athleisure. Uh, I recently did a panel with Brady Brand, and I'm not the biggest fan of Tom Brady on the field. They gave me some of his products, and then I met him, and I had to give him a compliment on how comfortable his joggers and everything mm -hmm. like that was. Um, I, I was emotionally conflicted, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can't take away the Super Bowl ring, so nothing to say there. 
how do you all approach trends when maybe you're not the first to welcome in a trend? but also entering a space authentically so it doesn't feel like, oh, this person or this brand is just trying to jump on the wave. Nigel? Um, sorry, can we read the question again? <laughs> how, do you, how do you approach trends if mm. it's athleisure right. or distressed things, a right. trend that you started? Right. Um, how do you enter a trend that you didn't start authentically so that you don't have imposter syndrome? Um. <clears throat> For me, like I tend to not really follow trends. Like, I'm not taking my career or taking my creative output and saying, "Well, what's on trend? Let it fit into that." Mm. Like for me, it's more about doing what comes naturally to me. You know, for like when I started riding BMX and I was wearing certain clothes that were more like BMX brands or skate brands. At that point in time, it wasn't cool, but to me, it didn't matter. You know, like this is what I love to do. This is what felt right to me. And it was very interesting to see how fashion has evolved and how streetwear and, like, that expression is so, like, dominant in fashion now. And all those things I used to wear are now, like, the main things, you know? So I really think at the end of the day, it's, like, just staying true to you. If a trend comes and it, and it, and it happens, you want to, like, participate in that, then cool. If, if not, then I don't think it matters, you know? Especially nowadays with social media and everyone has a platform. You can make things cool or start a trend, right. whatever you want, as long as you really, like, really believe in it and to the point earlier of like storytelling. Why don't you tell a good story behind it? Jess, from a brand perspective, how do, in your experience, how do brands approach trends that maybe you see a, a competitor or another brand making a lot of money or trending or everyone's wearing it and things are selling out? Is that something that you've seen uh, companies jump on? Or in your experience, have you seen companies be like, we're going to stay in our lane and figure things out and try to create our own trends rather than hop in someone else's lane. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky because I've worked for a lot of brands that have a really strong identity um, and also real leaders in innovation and wanting to be at the forefront of what's happening. But yeah, I would say in general, like as creatives, um, and I don't know if you agree with this, Nigel, but I feel like we're inspired by what's happening in the world. Right. So often it is automatically connected to like what's trending and what's happening because I'm inspired by like people and culture and what's happening. So um, and I think what I love about trends and fashion, which I think is similar to sports, and we kind of talked about this a bit before, Randall, is like they can actually um, transcend geographies and languages. Um, and I think that's really powerful. They can show up in different ways, you know, with different communities or in different places. But I think, yeah, whether it's like an athlete or a team or a trend, these things can resonate in like a lot of different places with different people. So now I want to talk, go back to feelings a little bit and stay with you, Jess, what is the feeling that you get when you see something that you designed and someone wear it? What is the feeling that you get with that? I mean, um, joy. <laughs> it's joy. <laughs> um, I love to design for like a lot of different people. I love to see people wearing the clothes, walking down the street, feeling good. Um, I think that's what it's all about for me at the end of the day. If I can design something that someone loves and it like adds like something special to their day or makes them feel great, like, that's my job done. It's great. Have you had a moment yet where you've, and maybe you had one today, where you've walked past someone and they're wearing something and it's been like, I, I want to take a picture of you, but I don't want to be weird. <laughs> um, yeah, probably. I probably have had that. Um, but yeah, I think it's nice. I actually have a designer on my team who always offers to sign everything when he sees people <laughs> wear his clothes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a really nice moment when you see someone um, wearing, wearing your product. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about the past, and I now I want to talk about the future in terms of trends. Uh, let's say the next five years. Where do you think things will be? And then my follow-up question, you don't have to answer this next one, but where do you want things to be? So the first one is, where do you think things will be in the next five years? It doesn't matter, Jess. It doesn't matter. I hope you, you want to take that, Jess? <laughs> Um, the next five years, wow. Um, I'm not really sure, actually. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually curious to see. You know, I think things are evolving and moving so fast, right? Like, who thought we'll be where we are now? Um, I feel like there's so much, like, individual style is happening. And we have this connectivity because of the internet. So we're seeing what fashion looks like in Germany, Tokyo, L.A., and right. Sao Paulo every single day on a feed, right. you know? So I think... 
that culmination of all, all that happening, um, I don't think really can dictate it, honestly. But I, I am curious to see where, like, where it goes. You know? I am too. I think at any given time, whether it's an NBA runway or mm -hmm. the Met Gala, you can have something that can set a trend for right. years. And that's the power of both fashion and sports. I think one of the things that could happen is that athleisure takes more intention in terms of messaging behind it. We've seen a lot of different items that um, are comfortable in wearing them, but they don't say much. And I think there's a definitely an opening there to have some sayings on them right. um, for whoever wants to take that idea. Um, Jess, what do, you, what do you think, where do you think things will be in the next five years? Well, um, I'm particularly excited by everything that's happening with AI right now. I think that's just like another amazing tool for creatives to explore. Um, I'm already on ChatGPT mid-journey, mm -hmm. like trying everything out. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I just think back to when I started in this industry and we would hand draw every single sketch. And every time we fit it and moved a button, we'd redraw the sketch and how far we've come along. Um, and yeah, I think in the next five years, we'll start to really be able to see and explore like what that's gonna mean for us, especially as creatives. Um, and I think where I want us to be, or where I'm hopeful is that in fashion, we can continue to change and adapt and move quickly because it is a, a changing industry. Um, and I'm hoping that we can continue to offer amazing um, forms of self-expression to people and keep expanding like what that means. You mentioned AI, and that is not something I had written down or even thought of <laughs> asking. Talk to me a little bit about how you're using AI within your everyday job. I mean, chat GPT for emails. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, just starting to really explore, especially on the image side, um, what kind of images can be generated. And I, for me, I see it as another tool. We already have like amazing tools. And you know, through COVID, we also got more um, digital collaborative tools in general as an industry. So we've already kind of been exploring new ways of doing things. I still really believe in craft, like I have an atelier here in the Garment right. District. I, I really believe in the craft and the physical aspect of, of fashion as well. But I think exploring a new tool is just always exciting and like creating images that you couldn't necessarily come up with yourself, I think is fascinating. I do think like how, the questions you ask though are very important. Um, and it's how you use the tool that we need to like explore and discover. Yeah, I'm fascinated. Sometimes when I see ChatGPT on Twitter or Instagram, there's a lot of debate within not just the fashion community, but the sports and even the corporate world of how to use it, if it's responsible. Uh, from a designer's perspective, do you think that using ChatGPT for various things can take away from the human experience? You know, I mostly use the image programs, to be honest, um, because I think... As a designer, something about the image process and the iteration um, is really fascinating. Um, but I do think that the human aspect is still so important. Like I say, I see it as a tool. I don't see it as a replacement gotcha. for anything that we're doing. I just see it as like another tool that we can use to continue to explore and iterate. Um, but I think, yeah, like I say, I still have an atelier. I'm still very much about the craft, the cut, the fit, the form, the fabric is the most important thing still. And Nigel, from a designer's perspective, in terms of where you start, you mentioned your Air Jordan 1 and how it started a distress trend. Where do you start when you think of creating, whether it be a shirt, a shoe model, a t-shirt? Where is your doorway? Um, so I take a lot of notes, like throughout my travels, throughout my day, right? If I see something that inspires me, I write it down, take a photo of it, if I'm scrolling through, a feed, I'll screenshot something. So depending on the project, I'll start there, right? I'll start on, like, I'll go through, like, this collection of data that I've, like, pulled over the last few months or the last few weeks. Um, sometimes it starts about, like, how can we solve a problem and create a solution, mm. you know? Um, I got recently, it actually comes out tomorrow, so um, we collaborated with, with Remova, and we created this amazing travel case, and that was, it really spawned out of creating a solution of how do I most efficiently travel with my bicycle, you know? And it turned out to be an incredible project, so look out for that tomorrow. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's either like one of those two places. Just for you, you mentioned a bunch of different fabrics. 
where is your doorway when you have a bunch of resources? And I don't know if you walk into a closet or a room where there's a bunch of fabrics, but where do you start as you walk into your creative workshop? Well, I actually loved what you're saying, Nigel, about folding the bike and like how you travel right. with it, because I think um, as a designer, I love to solve for a problem, right. actually. It's really, um, I think, inspiring to figure out like how could I make something better? How could I make the fit better? Is it through this construction? Is it through using a slightly different fabric? It's, again, the iterative process, but I do really love to start with more of a purpose to, to the design. And I think being able to combine a function with beauty is like a real sweet spot. Agreed. Agreed. Have you solved a problem where you feel like you created the perfect solution? I think um, design is always, uh, you're always able to do more. So I've definitely designed into things where I think there's a better solution mm -hmm. and I feel good about it, but I just think the, the, um, there's endless possibilities. What are some things for both of you that you haven't done that you want to? BMXer. <laughs> you want to switch careers with Nigel now. <laughs> There's a movie yeah. that people can switch careers with. Yeah. Like that. Oh. I, want to, I want to jump out of a plane on a BMX. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> Listen, you can ride up 3rd Avenue, 5th if Avenue see, right now and like make it a movie, I promise. If you see this in however many months on Nigel's Ghost series, right. you know where it started. You guys were here for a moment. <laughs> Um, I mean, listen, if you want to rob bikes, I can like, design some clothes. You know? <laughs> like, Let's do it. We could just switch for a week. Um, yeah, I want to design some clothes on like, like, like the highest level, I think. You know, like you, you guys make such a wider range of product, you know, that whether it's an undergarment or a denim or a top, whatever, like, it would not be super cool like, to get into the lab and cook something up, you know? So Maybe this is the start of a brand right. collaboration. <laughs> We're just Maybe. making dreams come this true. This is how it happens, right? <laughs> well, the difference is, like, when Nigel drops things, normally they're on the sneakers app, which I've never won a thing Yikes. on Nigel's thing. So whoever, please get my contact information so that I can win this time. Um, Nigel, is there, you've done, I saw you give a shoe away to PJ Tucker recently. Right. Um, I just lost the name of it. But PJ, yeah. forgive me. Um, <laughs> how do you think about when you are creating shoes? There are models such as the Nike Air Jordan 4 SB right. that recently released. We see dunks booming over the last couple of years. Right. How do you approach a model? Um, it's really a feeling. You know, sometimes the brand's like, this is the one you got to pick. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, we'll make it happen. <laughs> the shoe that you're referencing um, is the Nike Airship. Yes, and the Nike Airship is a is a really interesting story. So the Nike Airship is the first shoe that Michael Jordan wore when he came into the league, even prior to the AJ one. And the story behind that shoe, um, it's about proving yourself. And I feel like throughout my career, I've had to continuously prove myself because my sport isn't a traditional sport like basketball, football, baseball, etc. And, and it's it's a way smaller sport. It's a lot of times people don't really get it, right? They're like, ah, you. You're like, you're from Jamaica, Queens, and you ride a BMX bike, and they have this preconstructed notion of what BMX is, and it's like, you don't compete, but you're professional. It's like, ah, I really don't get it. Mm. Um, but I, I, I allow that to motivate me, you know, and I connected to that shoe again because I feel like, yeah, I, I've had to prove myself and prove why I'm here and prove why BMX matters. And the cool thing we did on this shoe, actually, so on the back of the shoe, it says, on like the, on like the heel tab, it says Nike Air. So we got permission to remove the N and put a B, and it says bike air. Mm -hmm. And like when people seen it, they <laughs> tripped, you know. So, so like, it like what to have the opportunity to put my own spin on this iconic Nike Air logo, and for it to make so much sense. Like when I'm on my bicycle, half the time I'm flowing through the air. Right. You know. Um, so that's. You should, that's how we got to that shoe. So now talk to me about why you gave it to P.J. Tucker. And before you answer, for anyone who has not looked up P.J. Tucker, he's a basketball player. Um, he has arguably the biggest shoe collection I've ever seen. He probably has more shoes than some of us have cells. Um, <laughs> talk to me about why you chose to gift him. Right. So I met P.J. at Fashion Week in Paris, actually, in 2019. Mm. 
and we just connected. And since then, we've seen each other around fashion weeks, whatever, chit chat. And like you mentioned, he has one of the most insane sneaker collections insane collection. in the world. And it was for that reason. I knew he would appreciate it. You know, like I could have gave that first biker shoe to anyone, but I knew he would really appreciate it. And also, it was a moment like we we're on <laughs> at, a, at a basketball game in yeah. Philly, and I'm able to like sit courtside and see him connect with him, and give him that shoe. And when I gave him the shoe, and, and, that, and also at this point, no one actually seen the shoe in its no. entirety at this point. It's the first time it was a moment people have ever seen the shoe. And the first thing he said was like, yo, and he's like jumping up and down like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> he just finished warm ups, he's sweating, got chains on, it's like great. <laughs> and he's like, the first thing he said was like, yo, me and my team we were just talking about this shoe. And I feel like it was that, right? It was like the connection was instantly there and he appreciated it. He was like, yo, we was ideating ideas about this shoe. And like he sat there and like looked at the materials and told him the story about it. It was just a really dope moment. Um, to connect with him. And again, at the core of it, it was like, I knew he would appreciate it. Intention. Right. Intention. Definitely super intentional. Jess, there are more athletes today than there are ever have ever been. When you are creating something, whether it be through a partnership, a collaboration, how do you figure out what athlete is right for your brand? Or athletes? Yeah, or I think just or people in general, but yeah, athletes. I think um, often it's about making sure that you stand for the same values. Mm -hmm. I think values yeah. is really important. Um, and then I think working with someone who loves the brand also, um, I think is, is great. Um, and I think from, from like a brand side and from like a designer side, I always wanna work with someone who can bring a new perspective um, and that we can have a conversation and a collaboration that really um, both people can learn a lot through the process. It's not just about the final outcome of the product, but the whole journey of working on something together that you can both learn a lot, I think is the best. Yeah. I think if brands took, I'll say I think if there were more brands that took the approach of what you spoke of, there would probably be a lot more athlete collaborations and more <laughs> commercials and things like that. I want to stay on collaboration because I mentioned Nike SB, but one of the things away from Nike that I've seen, even whether it's Nike, Adidas, or any other brands that we all know, is I've seen a brand like Adidas collaborate with one of my favorite brands, Midwest Kids, which is a local um, clothing brand boutique in Ohio. And so I'm wondering from your perspective and in your experience, how have you seen brands reach out to smaller brands and collaborate and uplift some brands that are trying to grow into the next Adidas, Nike, Calvin Klein, or whoever? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, in, t in terms of like the collaboration process, I think it's always great to work with someone who can just bring you a different point of view. And like I say, you wanna be able to, both people really gain something from it. So I think if it's a larger brand, often you can gain something really amazing from working with a small partner who might have a, a you know more close-knit community, for example. Um, or who might think of things in just like a very different way. And then like to your point, I think for the smaller um, you know, brand, they can really have more of a reach, maybe more of an impact through a bigger platform. So I think it's always just about finding something where both people, like I say, can really um, learn from it. Nigel, from, for you, you, just, uh, you said previously that a lot of times when you're working with a brand or you're about to work with a brand, you have to do a lot of explaining. Right. Because you're not a traditional BMX biker where you compete in whatever competitions. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that process and having to explain and how it motivates you. Um, gotta get, you gotta make a good deck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? No, but um, I mean like I love to educate people on what it is that I do, where I come from in my community. And I also love to learn and, and absorb information. I put that in my tool chest and I continue to move forward. Um, so it's been a lot of that, having to educate, learn, relearn. Um, and I feel like that process just helps sharpen my sword, you know? Um, and, and I've had the incredible opportunity of getting started this conversation off with some of like the biggest brands in the world right. that I have the opportunity to work with and, and collaborate with. And I have to say, like in my experience, like these brands are open airs mm -hmm. and like the, uh, it's an open door. Like, well, teach us, educate us. So it's what you're saying, Jess. Like, 
lot of these bigger brands saying, cool, we're going to work with a smaller brand or, or an athlete that may not be our traditional athlete to, like, learn more. And, and, and to be exposed to different communities, right. right? Like, when you think about what I do, I'm outside every single day riding my bike. And I may do 30, 40 miles a day. If you think about doing 30 or 40 miles a day in New York City, think about all the things you intersect with and touch with. And, and it's from music, um, cuisine, different neighborhoods, languages, like, all these different things. So I'm absorbing all these things on any given day. When I, like, when I go out and ride, the type of conversations I'm having, so I'm able to bring that into these rooms, collaborate with certain brands, and then everything that they have resources to and access to, I get that in, in exchange. So as much as I have to educate brands, I'm learning as well. So I appreciate that process. You said 30 to 40 miles a day? Yeah, it's easily. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Manhattan isn't even 30 or 40 miles. I know, but you got, you, got, you got to think about it, right? Like, I may ride to a spot, and then at that spot, I'm doing loops trying to land a trick, mm. and now ride to another spot and do that again, and then ride back home. You know, like, I live in Brooklyn, and, like, sometimes I'm riding over the Manhattan Bridge, and we ride up to Harlem, and in between that, we're stopping, doing tricks, doing our thing, and then we ride back home. That's like, insane. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a process, I, though. To keep the legs I was right. At Dreamville you know Festival. I, mean? <laughs> I was at Dreamville Festival uh, last weekend, and I took 15,000 steps. <laughs> 15, I thought I was doing well. It may have been more than that, but that's not 30 or 40 miles. That's, that's crazy. That's good. Anyways, you mentioned, you, you know, you've worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, but it didn't start that way. Uh, not at all. Talk to me about when you were early on, how did you decide which brands you wanted to work with when your career isn't what it was today? Um, right, so like the first few brands I got sponsored by was... Uh, this is like an amateur level sponsorship. It was like local brands here in, in like New York City. It was bike brands. Mm. And then um, my story is very interesting where I went on a, a, on a road trip. We drove from New York to North Carolina. And on this trip, I met um, the late, great Dave Mirror. And for those of you who don't know who Dave Mirror is, he's like the Michael Jordan of BMX riding. And met him and we just connected. And at that same time, he was starting a bicycle company, and he was looking to start a team. And he signed me maybe a couple months later as the second BMX rider to his team. And at that same exact moment, I met the team manager at Nike, and I signed to Nike a couple weeks later, and my career took off. So really, it was a matter of God's grace, mm. um, being in the right place at the right time, and my skill level and my talent level being at a level that I was prepared for the opportunity when it presented itself. You know, so like my boy Rafi would say, you have to stay ready, so I have to get ready. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shout out to my boy life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I've asked a lot of questions. I wanted to give the opportunity for the crowd for one question, because I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Does anyone have a question? You, sir. <laughs> this question is a perfect Yo. ending because I wanted to ask that. This question is, are you all releasing Yo. the Nike Airships, Nigel? And how can he get a pair? Listen, I was I was in my elevator coming back from getting breakfast two days ago, and this lady in like her mid-50s was like, where's your shoe? Can I get it? I was like, <laughs> to answer your question, um, we don't have a date yet. But we should have one soon. Um, so I'm sure once we do have a date, the internet's going to go crazy. So I'm sure you guys will all know. But I'm so, so sorry. Soon. I tried the pressure room. <laughs> I tried the fresh room. Anyways, thank you for the time. This is Jess Lomax, and I'm Sylvester, and I'm Randall Williams. Thank you all. Go this way, this way.